Hey all and welcome to our joyful home. Let's make some bread. I'm super excited to be sharing my homemade from scratch sourdough bread recipe. Finally, I'm sitting down, I'm getting this done, I'm filming it. I know there's been a ton of interest and a lot of you have been waiting very patiently for this video. So let's go ahead and without further ado, let's jump in. All right, so first things first, if you are new to sourdough and have no idea what this is and you just clicked on this video because you were interested, please go and watch this video up here in the card section. Um, it will explain what sourdough is. But if you're not new here to, or if you're not new to sourdough and you just want a really good, wholesome recipe, this is for you. So let's go ahead and start off with, you need a starter. Here is my starter. This is, Oh my words loud. <laughs> this is Charlotte. Yes, I named my starter. Um, she's been going for about six, five years now. And for about two years, she's been actively be actively being used. Um, I had a couple years there was on and off, on and off, on and off. But now I bake bread regularly every week. And so she's happy and she's bubbly and she's ready to be used. <laughs> when a starter is really active, you'll start to see a lot of bubbles. And this one's not super active because I already used it, but it was still slightly active, so I left it out for the video. Um, but when it's really active, you will see a starter very bubbly, very happy, and it's very obvious when it's active most of the time. As you can see here, and when the starter is really active, it's very bubbly, it's got lots of air bubbles, and it's it's just, it looks happy, it looks fluffy and light. and so that's a really good sign that your starter is active. So that's what you're going to want first and foremost before you start baking, is have a starter, a very active one. So if you don't have a starter, go get one. You can make one from scratch. A lot of other YouTubers here on YouTube have really good recipes on how to make your starter from scratch. I have not. I actually got mine from my aunt who bought, who gave her some of hers to me and hers she actually got some of her starter from my mother and my mother started her starter probably anywhere from 13 to 15 years ago so that's kind of cool it's a, it's an old starter <laughs> um, granted I've only had it for about five and a half years um, but it's kind of cool that it's come from a 15 well 13 to 15 year old starter but it's well established so if you can find a starter that someone has that's willing to give you some or you can buy from um, that's a great option. You can also buy some uh, dehydrated starter from different companies um, and they'll give you a dehydrated pack that you rehydrate and that's your starter. But you can also make it from scratch so I'd recommend before you even start this, go find a starter, make sure it's active and ready to go. Um, I'm not going to be talking about how to get activate your starter. Um, if you don't know anything about that, I will be making a future video on how I feed my starter, how I get it active and all that, but it's a lot to go in into and so I'm not for the sake of time so we're not going to go deep into that but make sure you have an active starter and one way to kind of look at this my recipe com my complete recipe for my bread starts about three days ahead of time so and let me explain so let's say my baking schedule is usually starts about on a Monday so Monday I take my starter out of the refrigerator in a hybrid hibernation state or a, a dormant state per se. It's not been fed, it's just dormant. It's there, it's still alive, but it's dormant. And so I take that out, I let it sit out all day or most of the day, as long as it has a few hours to reach to about room temperature or not really cold, you're going to let that sit. Right before you go to bed, you're going to feed it. And you just want to feed it enough to make your recipe or make feed it enough to make with, <laughs> feed it enough so that you have enough to make whatever you're using it for. Um, in this recipe, we, it calls for 250 grams of starter. Yes, I'm using grams and we are going to be using a, um, a scale. So this, I do not use measuring cups. I find that it's much easier and it's more accurate um, than cups and measuring utensils using a scale is more accurate. And so that's why I use a scale. You can totally use cups, but you will have to use the internet to kind of convert grams to cups. So there you go. But anyway, so just make sure you feed your starter enough to use enough starter so that it makes enough starter to, 
to then use in whatever recipe it calls for. So just make sure that you're feeding it that. And like I said, I'm not going into how to feed my starter, how to feed your starter yet. That's for another video. But anyway, make sure it's active and ready to go and you have enough starter to make your dough. Anyway, back to what we were saying. <clears throat> Looking three days ahead. So Monday, I take it out of the refrigerator, right? So I take it out of the refrigerator and let it sit, let it get warm so it's not cold. And then right before I go to bed, the evening before I even make my dough, I feed my starter. And so I feed it so that it has overnight, especially if you have a cold kitchen, you're going to want to make sure you feed your starter the night before so that it has all those hours to feed and rise. Um, so that's what I like to do and it's anywhere from six to eight hours and so it usually is just happy and perfect um, by then. If you have a really warm kitchen I would recommend either putting in a cooler area or even putting it in the refrigerator and maybe if not before you go to bed but like feed it in the afternoon and then that the next day take it out in the morning and hopefully it's risen enough um, but if you have a really warm kitchen, maybe feed it twice as much, and so maybe it, it, it'll it'll still be fine. But anyway, I have a cooler kitchen, or it's moderately cool. It's probably between 60 and 70 degrees, and that's a perfect time to just let your sourdough rise um, and ferment overnight. So anyway, now we're going on to right. It's Monday night. It's we've fed it. Now we're letting it sit overnight. The next morning. I take it and it should be doubled in size, if not more. And if it's overflowing out the top, that's a great sign as well. And that means it's active and bubbly and ready. It means, use me. <laughs> um, so anyway, but after that, you're gonna, so on that Tuesday, so the next day would be a Tuesday, I would make the bread and then on Wednesday, which would be the day after that, I would bake it. So that's kind of what I'm saying when I say it's three days ahead of time. You're thinking, oh, okay, the day before I make my bread dough, I need to make sure that the starter's ready. And then once that's done, the next day is making the dough. And then once that's done, you're going to leave those over those loaves of dough out or in the fridge overnight. And then the next day you're gonna bake them. So that's kind of, that's what this recipe is looks like. So make sure you're thinking like three days of, of preparation. So, and it's really easy, but you do want a couple days to just make the perfect bread. All right, so you've taken your starter, you've fed it, you've left it overnight, and you take it, and, and you wake up in the morning, and it's active, it's ready to be used. If you really need, if you're new and you really need, like, oh man, I'm just not so sure it's, it's ready, then you can do a really good test is to take some water, take a spoonful of starter, dump it in, and if it rises to the top, it's ready, and if it starts to sink and it's not ready it needs more time so that's a good rule of thumb um, or it needs to be fed but if it's been fed it just means it's not ready so anyway you want it to rise to the top you want it to float with all those bubbles it makes things float and happy and airy and yeasty so once you know for sure that your starter is fed and active and bubbly it is time to make your dough the next morning so it is Tuesday or the next day, right? And so your starter is active, it's ready to go. Here's a few things you're going to need for this recipe. One, you are going to need starter, which we already talked about. Two, you're going to need flour. And as far as flour goes, what I use is whole white wheat. And this is a company that's um, only located in Montana, but you can find other great sources. Uh, try to get one that doesn't, they don't spray their wheat uh, would be preferable. You can use ancient grains. I haven't played around with that, but you can try it. Um, but I use a whole white wheat. Um, I don't use all-purpose flour for the main baking because my husband's allergic to barley and a lot of them have, a lot of all-purpose flours have barley in it. So we don't, we try to stay away from all-purpose flour. I do use another flour to feed my starter that I don't use to make my bread with. I use a all-purpose white flour, unbleached, completely. All that's there is just the flour, so it doesn't have any added um, preservatives or additives. It's just white flour, nothing bleached. It's just pure all-purpose flour. I do use that to feed my starter with. It just does it. It's just easier and it rises faster, and so that's just what I found to work really well. Um, so I use that for my starter. I feed my starter with that flour, but what I 
use to make my bread dough with is just whole white wheat. So you're gonna need that. Oh, and you can use all different kinds of flour. Don't use ones that have a ton of additives with them or don't make sure you're not um, like self-rising flour is not a great option. Um, just make sure you're using really good flours that are high quality. Um, next is you're going to need some water. Um, I recommend filtered water if you live in the city. If you live in a country like I do, we live on well water and I'm not overly concerned about what's coming in to my house. I don't have fluoride. I don't have um, a lot of harmful chemicals. The only thing I'd be concerned about is pesticides and stuff that can leach into the soil, but there's only so much you can do and we don't have a filter. So I do use our tap water, but it is on well water. If you live in the city, please filter your water. You can get cheaper filters and filter your water, especially if you're making bread. Um, so you're gonna need water. Make sure it's a high quality water. Um, you're also going to need salt. I would really recommend high quality salt as well. Um, I use either, I use pink, pink Himalayan salt. You can also use Celtic sea salt. Don't use table salt or coarse um, ionized salt. Just make sure that it's pure sea salt. Um, like Himalayan and Celtic. Um, so those are the two I would recommend using. So pink Himalayan salt and then um, those are all the ingredients you're going to need. Now some equipment that's going to be useful to use is a spatula of some sort, a mixing spoon, or a you can use a mixer but this recipe is a hands-on recipe so I use my hands and spatula to make and mix my bread um, but you can use a mixer I've never tried it so you can try it if you want but anyway some sort of tool to mix with and you're gonna need a bowl you're going to need some tea towels um, you're also going to need a scraper this is kind of what it looks like there's a wooden handle and a metal and, um, square or rectangular edge and uh, you're also going to need a scale I weigh all my ingredients and so you'll need that scale um, you're also going to need a cast iron Dutch oven or a Dutch oven of some sort. Um, one that can reach really high temperatures because the temperature you're going to be baking on is 450 degrees Fahrenheit. So you'll want to make sure you get a really nice high quality Dutch oven. This is kind of the one I have. Um, you're also going to need some proofing baskets or a bowl to proof in. Um, proofing dough is kind of the overnight method before you bake it, which is what I do in this recipe. And so those are a few things, few of the things, few of the things you're going to need. Um, I'm sure there's a few things I've forgotten that we'll talk about in this video. And let's go ahead and jump right into actually making the bread. All right, so it's the next morning and you're, you, your starter's ready to use. So you're going to take your scale out, you're going to take a, the bowl you're using to mix everything up in, and you're gonna take that bowl, you're gonna set it on the scale and zero it out, because you don't want the weight of the bowl incorporated in the weight of the ingredients. So make sure you zero it out. Zeroing it out is essentially just taking the weight of the bowl out of the equation, so zero that out, and then you're going to add water. There are 730 grams of water in this recipe, so measure out your water in the bowl and try as, mu as much as you can to get a really good measurement. So try not to go too much over 730 grams or under. Try to get right in that 730 grams. If you go a little over or a little under, or a little over, it's, it's better than under. So just try not to go too crazy. You can also just scoop a little bit of water out and kind of just try to get more of an accurate measurement. After you've measured out the water, you're going to zero it out again because you're taking away the water amount and the bowl amount and you're going to be adding another ingredient. So zero that out as well. And then you're going to take and add your starter. And I do, there are 200, in this recipe it calls for 250 grams of starter. You're going to go ahead and just dump that. Be slow with starter because it can come out really fast and in big clumps. So use a spatula to kind of keep it back and just little by little, because it's harder to take starter out um, if you add too much. And so just little by little, try to add and make sure you get that 250 grams around that much. Um, if you go a little over, it's okay. Just don't go too much over. Um, so go ahead and add that starter. Once you've added the starter, you're gonna take it off the scale and you're going to take your, uh, this is a spoon I like to use. It's actually specifically designed for making bread dough um, and a lot of other baked goods, but I it's got a metal end to it and it's circular and it has a lot of different holes and 
you know anyway it looks really funny but it really works really well so with that you or you can use your hands whatever you want to do you're gonna mix the water and the starter together until it becomes a milky consistency and texture and so that you're kind of mixing in the starter to where it's well combined and there's not a lot of clumps or anything so you just want to really make sure it's mixed together really well after that you're gonna put it back on the scale zero it out and you're gonna add your flour uh, this recipe calls for a thousand grams of flour like I said I use this whole whole wheat flour um, or whole white wheat flour and so you're gonna go ahead and pour that in until you get about a thousand grams of flour flour is really easy to kind of take out if you add too much because the top isn't touching the the liquids so you can always just kind of top it off and then if it's too much you just kind of take it scoop it and put it back um, and take it out so that it's you not know, have too much flour but anyway so yeah once you've added a thousand grams of flour you're gonna take that off the scale again and you're gonna take that same spoon the little funny looking one and you're gonna mix it till it's well combined into a shaggy dense dough um, you can also use your hands if you're using your hands I'd recommend you get them wet so that you it doesn't stick to your hands as much um, if you're using your hands it's gonna stick and you are going to kind of stretch and use a stretch and folding process once the dough is incorporated to a shaggy dough um, but which you can see here but once it's it's dense it's shaggy it's mixed together well combined then you're gonna kind of and this takes anywhere from one to two minutes total from start to finish but once it's into a shaggy well-rounded dough you're gonna kind of stretch and fold it a little bit it's harder at this point because it's such a shaggy dough um, and the next time you do the stretch and fold because you're gonna repeat this process um, is it will be a lot easier to handle as you let it sit so once you've given it uh, about um, two minutes of kneading kind of kneading but it's a stretching and folding process because this is a no knead recipe um, you're gonna stretch it fold it and once it's it looks about good it, it's a shaggy dough it's sticky but it doesn't stick stick to your fingers so you can still touch it without it sticking heavily to your fingers it's not super wet but it's not super dry then that's that's a good sign that it's done um, but I would just give it one to two minutes to just kind of mix it up and stretching and folding so once that's done you're going to take your bowl and you're gonna set it aside with a damp tea towel over the top or a plate something covering it um, and so you're gonna let that sit for about an hour and a half to two hours all right once an hour and a half to two hours has passed you're gonna take that dough and you're going to repeat the stretching and folding process for the first time so it usually takes about three three to four times of repeating the stretching and folding process but anyway, um, you're also at this step, you're also going to be adding your salt. So take that scale back out, take the bowl, put it on the scale and zero out the weight of the bowl and the weight of the dough, which just zero it all out together. And then you're going to add your salt. Um, this recipe calls for 24 grams of salt. So once you've sprinkled that over the top of the dough and you've gotten enough salt and just slowly do it so that you have just about enough salt. Once you've done that, take it off the scale and add a little bit of water in your hand, just a tiny bit, like a little, little handful of water, and just kind of sprinkle it over the top of the dough. As you, as you can see here, this is kind of what I did. And then you're gonna take your fingers that are wet, make sure your fingers and your hands are wet. You're going to pinch the salt in really well. So like just pinch it till it's well combined into the dough. Nice and easy. It's really actually this is my favorite part it's so fun to like put my fingers in the dough and it feels so good anyway so pinch it in till it's well combined once it's well combined and all the salt's been really well well established into the dough you're gonna take the dough and you're gonna stretch and fold it and as you can see here the stretching process is just really taking a piece of the dough stretching it up as hard as almost as far as it'll go before it starts breaking and you're gonna fold it back down and push it into the dough and you're gonna turn the bowl each time you do that so stretch fold turn the bowl stretch fold turn the bowl bowl once you've gone all the way around you can keep doing it a little bit and I would keep doing repeating this process and each time it gets tighter so it'll be smaller stretches and folds as you can see here um, but I would do that um, one well two to three minutes because you really want to get that stretch in and that fold in so really stretch it and fold it for about two or three minutes and once you're done stretching and folding then you're gonna cover it back up with that tea towel and let it sit for a good two to three hours um, 
And you want it, if your kitchen's really cold or the area, then it might take longer. So make sure that you start your dough earlier in like early morning if you have a cold house. If you have a pretty normal house where you have fairly normal temperatures like everyone else, then follow this recipe to the T and you'll be fine. Um, but you usually repeat stretching and folding processes, I usually do, um, too long, like three times. Sometimes I'll do a fourth, especially if I want a longer period of it rising and proofing. Um, but anyway, so you're going to repeat this step again in another about two to, well, three to four hours. Once you've had three to four hours of it resting and rising, it should be doubled in size by this point. So um, that's what you're really looking for in this step is once it's doubled in size. And then you're gonna stretch and fold for another like minute. Um, just repeating that step that we did before, um, but you are only gonna need about a minute of stretching and folding this time. And then you're gonna let it sit until it doubles in size once again. And so this that would be the last time you stretched and folded it. Um, so now after it's been doubled it after it's doubled in size last time you're gonna take it and you're gonna dump it on a lightly floured surface your counter will work just fine okay woke up. not very happy <laughs> all right so once you've dumped you've taken out the dough and put it on the lightly floured surface you're going to divide that in half you can use a knife or you can use this little scraper gadget that I have. Just kind of cut it down the middle evenly. And then you now have two loaves. So once you've cut your loaves into two, you're going to go ahead and kind of mold them into a shape. So what I like to do is kind of flatten it out into a rectangular, rectangle shape. Lay it out kind of flat. It doesn't even have to be a specific shape, but lay it out flat. Um, kind of mold the dough almost like you were gonna make a pizza dough or something, but like lay it out flat flatten it out and then you're gonna kind of Shape it back into a loaf or a round round shape of sorts um, As you can see here and from there once it's rounded shape you're going to kind of cup it in your hands and pull it towards you on a uh, on the counter space so try not to get a flowered surface so if there's a surface near where you're working that doesn't have flour on it, use that surface because it'll uh, stick better. And so just cup your hands and pull it tight toward you and just keep repeating the step and go in circular motions while cupping and pulling towards you. Um, as you can see here in this video, what I'm doing is just kind of cupping and pulling towards myself till you get a nice tight mold of or round rounded loaf of dough. After you're done with that, you're gonna go ahead and do the same to the other loaf, and you're gonna let them sit for about 20 minutes, well, 10 to 20 minutes on the counter. After about 10 to 20 minutes, you're going to take the loaves and you're going to do the same thing with the cupping the hands and pulling towards you. So you're just making it more of a tighter, circular-shaped dough. And so you're just gonna repeat that and repeat that to, the, to both loaves. And then once it's got a really good shape and it's nice and tight or taut, it doesn't have to be super tight and you don't need to overdo it, just enough to make it nice and well molded. So once that's happened, it's nice and well formed is a better way of putting it, a well formed dough. Then you're gonna take your proofing baskets. Um, most proofing baskets will come with a cloth that has elastic attached to it so that it attaches itself to the bowl really well. If you don't, you can always use a tea towel and just lay that across the bowl and inside the bowl and kind of just let it sit there. Either way, just make sure um, that the tea towel or the cloth is inside the bowl. And then you're gonna go ahead, bowl or basket, and you're going to line it with the cloth and then sprinkle some flour over the top. And once you've done that, you can also do that, prepare the bowls while your dough is resting for the 10 to 20 minute period on the counter. So you can do that while, while you're waiting. Um, but either way, make sure that those baskets or bowls are ready for, for the next step. So the next step is taking that nicely formed dough and you take take that dough and put it in your proofing basket and as you can see i kind of just take my hand or or a tool of some sort and scrape underneath and then flip it upside down into the bowl um and then so it's kind of like yeah 
flipping it upside down. Um, so after you've done that, you put it in the bowl, then you sprinkle the top with some flour and cover either with some saran wrap or a damp tea towel. Make sure it's fairly damp because you're going to be putting this in the refrigerator and it does tend to dry it out a bit more if you're not using plastic wrap. So make sure it's damp. So once you've covered them, then you're going to go ahead and put them in the refrigerator to proof overnight. So now it is baking day and you've let your dough sit overnight in the refrigerator and so you've taken it out it's double in size you don't even have to take it out right now but it's nice it's happy what you're going to do next is you're going to take your dutch oven and you're going to preheat the dutch oven and your oven together um, on bake and 450 degrees so you're going to go ahead you're going to start your oven take the dutch oven make sure it's well seasoned and you're going to go ahead and put that in the oven and right before it's done preheating is the next step. So go ahead and take your dough out of the refrigerator. If you think it's about halfway done preheating, this is a good time to take your dough out. One bowl of dough at a time. Um, so while the one is baking, the other one can stay in the fridge. Um, but take it out and you're gonna prepare, score and prepare the dough for the oven. So the first thing you wanna do is take the dough out and then you're gonna want to grab a piece of parchment paper or you can use a silicone mat as you can see here this is what I use I have actually cut the silicone mat to shape to the shape of a round dill loaf um, with some handles on the sides as you can see here um, you can also buy them that the way instead of cutting them you can buy them that way on Amazon and other stores but I just cut mine because I had two of them anyway so you're gonna take that you're gonna um, take that little piece of either silicone or parchment paper. If it's parchment paper, I would recommend cutting it into that shape like I had with the silicone mat. You can also do a square shape, it just it, it works really good to kind of cut around it and it's much easier to pull in and out. Um, so I would, so take whatever you're gonna use and take that bowl of dough and take the mat, put it over the top and then flip it as you can see here. Um, that's kind of what I do. It's the easiest way of getting the dough onto the mat um, or the parchment paper and you're just going to flip it over. You can also put some flour in between them if you feel the need to. Um, after that you're going to take the bowl off the dough and it's on the mat and then you're going to sprinkle some flour over the top of the rounded dough loaf and you're, at this point you're going to score the dough. Uh, scoring is just cutting little pieces of the dough um, so that once it rises it has somewhere to kind of break open. You don't have to score dough, it just makes it prettier and I like to score it. Um, you do not have to, um, it's not going to hurt the dough at all. Um, but it does tend to look prettier if you do score it. So I do like to score it, you can score it any number of ways you want. You can look up different tutorials on scoring your dough, different designs. Um, I usually do a little like like wheat design um, you can also do cross or whatever you would like um, so score your dough once that's done then you're gonna make sure your ovens preheated and so by then it should be preheated and you're gonna take take that Dutch oven you can keep it in the oven or you can take it out but I usually just keep it in the oven take one of the racks halfway out with the Dutch oven on it and take the Dutch oven lid off you're gonna put that dough, just gently put it in there with the mat or the parchment paper. And then you're going to take the lid, make sure you use, you use hot pads, and you're going to put the lid on and shut the oven and bake for 25 minutes. Um, after 25 minutes, you're gonna take the lid off the Dutch oven and you're going to bake it uncovered for another 10 minutes. And that just kind of makes it more of a crisp, pretty look. Um, to your dough and finish it off finishes it off in a nice crisp artisan bread looking looking way so after the 10 minutes you can get the bread out just I would take it right out especially if you're going to be baking the second loaf right away then what I would do is take the bread out you should be able to use hot pads and take the little handles of the um, either the parchment paper or the mat and just lift it out and put it in an area that it can just sit and cool. Um, but you're gonna wanna keep it in the oven if you're gonna use it again, it just keeps the heat.
temperature even. Either way, your bread is done and you can either bake the other one, repeat the step, or you can leave it in there for a bit longer and not worry about it for a bit. But your bread's done. You've baked it. It should look nice and it should look very pretty. It should have risen and about doubled in size. Um, and then you can cut it open. As you can see here, this is what mine looks like usually. Um, and then once it's cool, you can cut it. It should taste so good. I love this bread recipe. It has done wonders for us. We eat it once a week. I usually make either one to two batches of this for our family. Um, one batch does us fairly well each week. We That's two loaves of bread and that's good for sandwiches. It's good for bread during dinner. Um, lots of breakfast, toast, you know, just it does us really well. And I do this once a week. So, But the bread suits us well for, for all of our bread needs. Um, I haven't actually used store-bought store -bought bread in forever and we really don't eat store-bought bread. I don't like it and I'm very glad that I found this recipe. So anyway, that's how I make my bread. I hope you guys enjoyed it and I hope it was helpful. And before we end this video, I do want to say that I got this recipe off of a, or from a gal. I don't follow her recipe to the T, um, but I got my inspiration for my recipe from her. But you can go check her out at ballerinafarm.com or on YouTube, it's Ballerina Farm. She's also on Instagram. But I got her, my recipe, my inspiration to my recipe from her. I follow a lot of the same things she does, uh, definitely the same. Um, measured amounts of ingredients um, but I really like her her recipe is kind of where I got mine and so I do things differently than she does but if you're interested in looking at hers and see how close closely our recipes are you can go and look, check her out um, but that is where I got my recipe I just kind of wanted to make that clear but yeah there's lots of good recipes out there this one has just fit our family really well because I can do it slowly and I only have a few steps throughout the day that I have to follow in order to make it. It's not like this, oh my word, for hours I'm baking. This is literally like, okay, take a few minutes out of your day, a few minutes here, a few minutes there out of your day. And so it's just throughout the day you're making your bread. So it's pretty easy and with littles I've definitely found that it's, it's an easy recipe to follow. So anyway, I hope that it's easy for you. If you have any questions or something's not quite right, you're just like, you know, you didn't explain this correctly or whatever. If you have any questions or need some clarification on anything, please let me know in the comment section down below. And if you have any ideas on sourdough videos that you would like to see on this channel, please let me know in the comment section down below as well. Um, but look forward, I'm looking forward to making more great sourdough content on this channel. So stay tuned and I'll see you guys in my next video. Have a great one. Bye.